tonight. First, there was heat. Now here comes the political fireworks around allegations of election meddling by China. A fake new position that they have invented. Rapporteur, does it come with a costume? The leader of the opposition has never taken this issue seriously. Order! Order! Why the opposition isn't buying the government's response. Two Americans now dead after a horrifying abduction in Mexico. We want to see accountability uh, for the violence that has been inflicted on these Americans. Why well, authorities say it was likely a case of mistaken identity. And inside Canada's mission to train Ukrainian troops on those critical leopard tanks. So the loader will be on this side, the gunner and commander on this side. Exclusive access to the tank training grounds and the race to get them ready for war. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Just one day after the Prime Minister tried to cool things off over China's attempts to meddle in Canada's elections, the opposition is firing back with some of its harshest critiques yet. This whole conversation is just one sign tonight of growing tensions with China both here and in the U.S. And in a moment, we'll bring you the hardline message Beijing is sending Washington, raising the prospect of conflict if the U.S. doesn't soften its tone. But first, Ashley Burke brings us the raucous back and forth here in Canada as the Conservatives lead the charge against the Liberals over an issue that has unsettled many Canadians and left the government playing defense. The leader of the opposition taking his attacks to a new level. It is actually incredible that we have this uprising at our intelligence body. Blaming the Prime Minister for intelligence leaks around Chinese election meddling. They are so concerned about how the Prime Minister is acting against Canada's interests and in favour of a foreign dictatorship's interests that they are actually releasing this information publicly. <laughs> Pierre Polyev and his party amping up their attacks as well in the House of Commons. It's burying the truth in process. Why? Yeah. Openly mocking the government's plan to appoint a special rapporteur to examine foreign interference. Rapporteur. A fake new position that they have invented. Rapporteur. Uh, does it come with a costume, maybe a cape or <laughs> and a sword? We didn't need another reason to see that the leader of the opposition has never, has never taken this issue, issue seriously. Never. Conservatives also dismissing Trudeau's plans for a committee of parliamentarians, all with top secret clearance, to conduct a review of their own. He announced that a secret committee with secret hearings will hear secret evidence and then give the Prime Minister a secret conclusion. When will he call a public inquiry and tell everybody what he's hiding? Is this truly what the Conservatives have resorted to now, denigrating the very institutions that are there to protect our democracy? Is that all they have to offer? Polyev said his MPs won't boycott that review. Other parties say they'll also take part. We will be part of every and any process that will anyhow contribute to protect our democracy. Don Davies will participate, of course, but we want to be clear, we don't think that's sufficient. What they want is a public inquiry, but Trudeau has now outsourced the decision on whether or not to call one to that special rapporteur. The special rapporteur will be there uh, to ensure that Canada has all the mechanisms and tools necessary so, Ashley, the Prime Minister says he's open to suggestions from opposition parties as to who they want to see as this rapporteur, but could the opposition ultimately get some kind of veto power? Well, Adrian, that's unclear. The Bloc Quebecois has asked that Parliament vote on the appointee, but the government wouldn't commit to that today. Jagmeet Singh says that he's ready to offer input, and as for Polyev, he's convinced Trudeau will choose someone friendly to the Liberals. Now, the government hasn't said who it has in mind, other than that it will be an eminent Canadian with an appointment coming in a matter of weeks. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you. Well, all of this is straining Canada's relationship with China. Tensions between China and the U.S. are also clearly worsening. That's spelled out in a stark new warning to Washington from Beijing. Paul Hunter now with what was said and how the U.S. is responding. Think U.S.-China relations are at a low point? 
consider the words from Beijing during the annual National People's Congress in the first news conference by China's new foreign minister. The U.S. perception of China, he said, is seriously distorted. This leads to a complete deviation from rational and healthy policy. This after last month and that bizarre incident as the U.S. shot down what it says was a Chinese spy balloon or what China called a weather balloon gone rogue. It was an irritant for both countries but came on the heels of so many others. From U.S. worries China may give weapons to Russia for the war in Ukraine or that it may go to war itself over Taiwan to Chinese annoyance, the U.S. is now more forcefully blaming the pandemic on a Chinese lab leak and language like this. We are at war with China. At a congressional committee hearing last week on cyber attacks and fentanyl smuggled in from China. Every single day, China attacks us via cyber and our allies. Every single day, China partners with drug cartels and they poison our children with fentanyl. This is intentional. On China's view of American rhetoric and policy broadly, if the United States does not hit the brakes, he said, there will surely be conflict and confrontation and catastrophic consequences. The White House, in turn, is making its position clear. We do not see conflict, and, do, and we do not want conflict. What we're seeking is competition. We see this as a consequential relationship that we will, we will continue to manage. So, Paul, the words from China certainly, you know, on the face of it, sound alarming. But is it actually right to take them that way? Yeah, well, you know, Adrian, the complicating part is that it's never easy to know the answer to that. Words matter, and this is a superpower using those words, conflict, confrontation. So the U.S. certainly can't ignore them. Uh, the U.S. is emphasizing, not just at the White House today, but also at the State Department, that, yes, there are tensions with China and that they must be recognized and worked through. The U.S. underlining today it aims to compete with China and win that competition, but that it wants no part of conflict. And it urges that China understand that. All right. Paul Hunter in Washington, thank you. You're welcome. So Paul mentioned that downed balloon. Well, Canada's defense minister was answering questions about it today, along with the other three objects shot out of the skies last month. But there aren't a lot of answers about what they were or where they came from. The reality is we don't have the data from the downed uh, balloon off the coast of the United States, and we don't have data from the three other incidents. Anita Anand was appearing before a national defense briefing. She did say the objects don't appear to be operated by a foreign power. First part. <clears throat> two Americans have returned home tonight and two others are confirmed dead after a terrifying kidnapping in Mexico. It's believed they were caught up in a case of mistaken identity involving Mexico's notoriously violent drug trade. Chris Reyes has the latest. <laughs> They went into Mexico as a group of four friends. Only two have come home alive. Escorted across the border by Mexican ambulance and army vehicles, one with serious injuries. This video appearing to show the violent moment when it all went wrong in a part of Mexico dominated by warring factions of a powerful drug cartel. Mexican authorities say the Americans were caught in a shootout, then kidnapped late last week launching an extensive days-long rescue effort that ended today when Mexico's president confirmed the Americans were found, two of them dead. Dashing hopes of this family member, who up until this morning wrote on Facebook she was keeping the faith that her brother was still alive. She wrote in a GoFundMe post that the four friends were going to Mexico for a tummy tuck when they were caught in the crossfire. We want to see accountability uh, for the violence that has been inflicted on these Americans that tragically uh, led to the death of two of them. U.S. officials want more information on exactly what happened. I've been briefed by the FBI, which is working with Mexican authorities, and senior department officials are working closely with our counterparts at the State Department. The kidnapping happened in the city of Matamoros, right across the border from Texas. Both the U.S. and Canada have high-risk travel advisories against going to that region. Ottawa warning citizens that clashes between cartels and gangs are common. 
Families of the victims have not come forward to share details. U.S. officials are in touch with the families of the individuals, but again, we will respect their privacy regarding our conversations with them. The two Americans who died are still in Mexico, where authorities say their bodies will be returned after their investigation. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Tonight, the top leader of the European Union, representing a region of nearly 450 million people, is in Ottawa. And as Catherine Cullen shows us, while seeking some tighter bonds with Canada, she also signaled certain priorities, including a changing climate and a shared commitment to the war in Ukraine. A big greeting at a significant time. Russia's war on Ukraine looms over Canada's relationship with Europe. Ursula von der Leyen praised Canada for doing more than its fair share to help and commended efforts to train Ukrainian soldiers. And I cannot overstate this. Canada has saved Ukraines in the first days. Canada announced more assistance for Ukraine today, extending its engineering training program, help for demining and supports for Ukraine's power grid. We will keep supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes. But living up to that could be a challenge. Western arsenals are pretty much topped out. So there is a big question about how collectively this coalition will continue to support Ukraine. It says lithium ion. Europe has economic interests to explore here too, eyeing Canada's growing production of critical minerals like lithium. They are the lifeblood of the clean economy. We see today that, for example, China produces 98% of Europe's supplies of rare earth. And Europe needs to de-risk this dependency. Pierre Polyev argues Canada could also be helping supply Europe with liquefied natural gas. He blames the Prime Minister for not doing more to help the industry. He's helping fund foreign dictatorships by shutting out our industry. The Prime Minister argues it's up to business to decide if gas projects go ahead. It's private companies, just like it's private companies uh, in, uh, in Germany uh, and in Europe that are uh, receiving and putting orders for LNG from Canada. Von der Leyen says she's focused on the future. The vast majority of energy will be renewables. But getting Europe off both Russian oil and Chinese minerals will be a challenge. Canada's industry is still a work in progress. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. So you heard von der Leyen there praising Canada on its training mission, where you're going to see that mission up close. Coming up, David Common takes us inside a Canadian effort to help change the battlefield in Ukraine, giving Ukrainians a fighting chance in better tanks. That's in about 15 minutes. A 24-year-old man has pleaded guilty to assault after a gravel-throwing incident involving Prime Minister Justin Trudeau back in 2021. So Trudeau was leaving this campaign event in London, Ontario, when gravel was thrown at him as he was getting on the bus. He wasn't injured in the incident. Today should have been the first day of a trial for assault with a weapon, but instead the accused pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of common assault. Alberta is once again pushing back against federal moves to limit gun ownership. Today, the province's justice minister introduced what's called the Alberta Firearms Act. Every Albertan should be concerned about the precedent set by the federal intrusion into property rights of law-abiding and responsible Albertans. If passed, the bill would let the province control who's allowed to seize guns and could stop municipalities and police services from working with Ottawa to take the guns. The bill would also create a provincial committee to ensure gun owners receive proper compensation if firearms are seized under federal legislation. A new report from BC's Human Rights Commission has revealed a disturbing rise in hate and discrimination over the course of the pandemic. It says the provincial government's response was ineffective. Susanna De Silva now with what it says needs to change. Trixie Ling says that moment three years ago when a man called her racial slurs and spat on her was life-changing. That really woke me up. I think that was the catalyst for me to be really angry and to not be silent, to talk about it. They start sharing, this is what it motivated her to start a charity helping immigrant women. I want to see funding, I want to see resources, I want to see action invested to our community-led initiative. 
Ling's was one of hundreds of hate crimes reported to police during the pandemic, believed to be a fraction of the crimes that actually occurred. Overall hate incidents reported to the police have increased between 100, uh, increased 118 percent. Hate of all kinds went up across the country, with B.C. seeing some of the most dramatic increases, including a sharp rise of anti-Asian hate up 482 percent. While hate is not new, the pandemic marks a period in our collective experience that's been filled with fear, mistrust, division and hate. The report calls on the provincial government to create a more coordinated response, the police and courts to do more in terms of prosecutions and for more education in schools. Ever met a rabbi before? Wow, that's okay. I'm it. As the report was released, a group called The Other People, representing several ethnic and religious backgrounds, was in a Vancouver high school. The man behind the group says the report didn't go far enough. Racism is not going to be dealt with with words, slogans or posters. We need to have specifics as to how to break down, which is why we're here, because we want the students to meet a Muslim, to meet a Sikh a Jew, a, a, a black individual and so on, face to face. London, Ontario, it was a message that resonated. Just really learning to take the time to educate ourselves and to like call people out and not be afraid to call people out, like make a stand. And that is the only way advocates say change is going to happen. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. A complaint about the alleged behavior of a Supreme Court justice is now under review. Justice Russell Brown has been on leave from the court since the beginning of February. Shortly after the complaint was received, the Canadian Judicial Council announced today it's conducting the review but would not reveal the nature of the complaint. The federal government says people convicted under historic indecency and anti-abortion laws can now apply to officially clear their names. Those laws have disproportionately affected women and LGBTQ people. Sarah Levitt now with the pain it's caused in the process to erase convictions. For the past few decades, Ron Roseness has devoted his life to gay rights. It's a matter of principle. He was motivated in part by his arrest in 1981. I was at the Roman steam bath uh, enjoying myself in what I thought was a safe space uh, when the police raided uh, the establishment. Roseness was charged with being found in a common body house. Until 2013, a body house was defined as a place of prostitution or where acts of indecency took place. For decades, police used indecency laws in justifying raids on gay clubs, bathhouses and swinger clubs. This is about addressing an historical injustice. Now, Ottawa says people charged under indecency and anti-abortion laws dating back to 1892 can get their records wiped clean. This is a tangible way in which we can um, take the next important step to move beyond uh, words. Today's announcement is part of a series of promises made by the federal government following Justin Trudeau's official apology to LGBTQ Canadians in 2017. That recognition from the government that what happened to someone was wrong should never have happened. They should never have been considered a criminal. Uh, it's deeply meaningful. But the path towards getting an expungement isn't easy, advocates say. They'll have to gather uh, evidence of the conviction or a satisfactory affidavit. So I think it'll be interesting to see the uptake on those who choose to apply. That uptake isn't expected to be high. Just over 18,000 records may be eligible for expungement, but the Parole Board of Canada estimates it'll receive only about 2,500 requests. You know, I think it's, um, uh, I was arrested unjustly. Now, Roseness needs to figure out if he's eligible and if he can finally lift the weight of his arrest all those years ago off his shoulders. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Tim Hortons has corrected a glitch in its popular Roll Up the Rim contest, but not before some players were led to believe they'd won big. A technical problem, apparently, resulted in some players getting an incorrect award message for a few hours Monday morning, and that award, a $10,000 prepaid Amex card. Tim Hortons says the problem is now fixed, but it will not honor the mistakenly awarded prizes. The company also says it's apologized to those affected. More young people are being diagnosed with colon cancer, but recommendations around screening still haven't changed. 
I almost felt like I had to, to prove that my symptoms were something more serious. How it could affect the outcomes for patients. Canada's single-use plastic ban is getting its first major challenge. We won't be deterred by a few international companies. What the case will hinge on. And choosing sportsmanship over sport. I went over and I just like told her that she was doing good. We're back in two. Those fiery clashes were in France today as protests over pension reform shut down much of the country. Thousands marched in Paris and other cities on the sixth National Day of Action since January. The protesting workers also blocked access to oil refineries and then they disrupted transit. French union leaders are demanding the government halt plans to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. A new health study out of the United States is revealing a worrying trend. Colon cancer deaths are on the rise in younger adults, and cases are appearing more often, too. As Lauren Pelly tells us, the same trend is playing out here in Canada. You're silly. That was a raspberry. When Alexis Julio started experiencing unusual symptoms after the birth of her third child, she worried most about what a health issue would mean for her kids. For months, the 35-year-old kept noticing blood in her stool. But because of her age, she says her primary care team brushed off her concerns. I almost felt like I had to, to prove that my symptoms were something more serious. Here, why don't you put those on the table? After finally getting a colonoscopy months later, Julio learned she had stage 1 colon cancer. She ended up needing surgery to remove roughly 30 centimeters of her colon. That's something that I can't quite wrap my head around where I would be if I hadn't been able to advocate for myself. New data from the American Cancer Society suggests her experience isn't quite as rare as you'd think. In the U.S., incidents of colorectal cancer have been rising in people under 50, 2% each year since 2011. When you're magnifying, how... At a screening clinic in Toronto, this gastroenterologist says Canadian clinicians are seeing similar see trends. Also, we find the cancer at a later stage than we do in our older patients. Scientists suspect some combination of diet and lifestyle changes in recent decades could be at play. But no one's sure exactly why colon and rectal cancers are hitting younger people harder than before. Two years ago, the U.S. lowered its recommended age for screenings from 50 to 45. It's definitely a conversation that should be had for sure. The right answer is not clear. In Canada, most screenings still don't happen until you're 50, unless you have a family history of colorectal cancer. You have the probe, simply poke it into the stool. The Sorry, lead scientist for screenings in Ontario says it's not yet clear uh, if the benefits for younger adults not, would outweigh the risks of colonoscopies. And those include things like if we find a precancerous growth called a polyp and have to remove it, there's a risk of bleeding or there's a risk of puncturing uh, the colon. If you get to there, okay. Yeah. Julio says even if someone isn't yet eligible for screenings, they should be upfront with their doctor if they notice any unusual bowel issues. Don't be scared of those things. Um, it's important to get things checked early. So Lauren, the people watching this might be a little younger, might be suddenly worried. What are they supposed to do? Well, a lot of us are uncomfortable talking about these sort of issues with our body, but you have to be paying attention and you have to flag these type of concerns with your doctor, even if you're under 50. So I'm talking about symptoms like blood in your stool, changes to your bowel function, feeling bloated and full. All of these could be caused by different conditions, but you want to rule out something serious. And also, if you're an older adult with younger adult children, you might want to flag to them to be watching for this stuff because looking out for these issues, you could save a life including your own. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Ukrainian soldiers are racing to learn how to operate Leopard 2 tanks, but they're not doing it alone. This is a crash course tank school. An exclusive look inside Canada's mission in Poland. Plus. Countries that absolutely rely on, on uh, this energy are going to go somewhere else for it. There's a new push to mine Canada's largest fossil fuel reserve, but this time the community's getting a say. We are in the driver's seat. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next.
used properly, tanks can be devastating on the battlefield. And in its invasion of Ukraine, Russia has held an overwhelming tank advantage. Canada is trying to change that. Not only is Canada giving Ukraine tanks, Canadians are now in Poland training Ukrainian soldiers on how to use them. David Common got exclusive access to a critical mission. Getting those skills up to speed in a matter of weeks is also a matter of life and death. As Ukraine fights for its survival, we're taking you inside Canada's mission to help redefine the battle space. Rare access to live fire learning. This is a crash course tank school, less than a month to take Ukrainian soldiers off the front lines, bring them here to Poland and train them on those Leopard tanks. To do that, Canadian soldiers were called up with barely any notice to come here. Tank training grounds in Poland, next door to Ukraine, but a world away from its violence. So you want to stay kind of further back because uh, the stab system is on, which means that the turret could move around at any time. And time Edmonton base captain Brittany Shkagizis runs the program to convert experienced Ukrainian tank crews into Leopard specialists. So How long have you been on those? I've been uh, doing tank stuff for about three years. What do you think of them? I love them. There's nowhere else I'd rather be than on my tank doing maneuver, doing shooting, anything. It's Nothing beats it for me. The Ukrainians may already be the most battle-hardened tank fighters in the world. Observation regime. And we're going to be shooting in turret off. We're going to be shooting eight rounds per tank today. In the comparative safety of neighboring Poland, dozens of Canadian soldiers are training those veteran Ukrainians on fighting with a tank far more sophisticated than the Soviet era models they've been using so far. Better targeting, better range, better maneuverability, better protection. During the training we could... Uh, Polish captain Konrad Stefanovic knows all about making that switch. His country hosting not just the training, but driving the donations of dozens of Western tanks for Ukraine. How are they finding the differences between the Ukrainian tanks they've been using and the Western tanks they're about to be able to use? Mm, they really appreciate this tank. They see its advantages. And to be honest, this tank uh, has no... This tank has only advantages over the Soviet-made tanks. And they really looking forward to using them in the future on the battlefield. Canada has sent more than 100,000 rounds of ammunition, plus eight of its own Leopard tanks, the oldest in the Canadian Armed Forces. They're now bound for the front line, so the vehicles used for training are Poland's own. So the loader will be on this side, gunner and commander on this side, and then the driver is in the hull on the uh, right side down there. We're not permitted to show the faces of Ukrainian soldiers for their protection but they are eager to be here, away from the grueling, relentless, bloody fight for inches being fought in towns and across vast fields just like this. What do you want to see these tanks do in Ukraine? <laughs> the goal is destroy the enemy, chuckles this Ukrainian major. His name is being withheld, but he does say he had retired from the army before being pulled back by war to train a new generation on newer tanks. Do you, do you think the Russians will be scared? They're already scared, he tells us, but we need more ammunition as well. Indeed, there are no illusions here. The donated Leopard tanks from Canada and European nations combined with Challenger tanks from Britain and Abrams from the U.S. will no doubt help Ukraine. But it won't turn the tide on its own. Many of these trainees may not survive for long. It's a, you know, it's a difficult subject, but uh, people die in war. And in this war, a lot of people are dying. How is it for you knowing that some of the people that you're training now may end up being killed on the battlefield? Uh, that's a very hard question, but, uh, well, we expect that there will be some casualties. This tank isn't invincible. It's uh, 
one of the top of the world, but every kind of equipment can be destroyed and there will be wounded, there will be killed, of course, but that's, that's how it is during the war. We just hope that our training will and those skills, the experience, to, to minimize those casualties and to maximize the effectiveness of the use of this equipment so they can win the war quicker and with less wounded, less dead soldiers, fewer dead soldiers. See that barrel carefully shifting? It's tracking a moving target two kilometers away. The Leopard's capable of striking more than twice that distance, day or night, hunting while hidden and still or on the move. This just missed the target, but most rounds find it perfectly. The Canadians adding they're learning from the Ukrainians as much as they're teaching. A brutal war of attrition wages just one nation away. Soon this group of soldiers will be back in it, back to be the first to use leopards in this conflict, and new soldiers will come here to be trained. A cycle likely to continue until this war somehow ends. Now, David did mention there that keeping all this in perspective, Canada is giving Ukraine eight Leopard 2s. With all the Western help, that means Ukraine will have around 1,000 tanks of various models. It's believed Russia can still field twice that number. So on paper, at least, this was never a fair fight, and it still isn't. A different fight, the one over fossil fuels, is heating up in BC, and the stakes have never been higher. This is the global map of carbon bombs. The debate over what to do with Canada's largest fossil fuel reserve. A BC First Nation now has a say over part of Canada's biggest fossil fuel deposit. This is a source of natural gas so huge, many call it a carbon bomb, named for the scale of climate disruption it could cause with environmentalists everywhere glued to what happens next. Tara Carmen traveled to Blueberry River First Nations to show us the damage already done and to ask community leaders how they'll use their influence. The tranquility, peacefulness and vastness of northern BC seems untouched. But just below the surface, almost 20,000 wells have left their mark. This is Canada's largest fossil fuel reserve and home to a small First Nation. Nearly all of Blueberry River First Nation is within 250 metres of an industrial disturbance, like this one. And with all of this untapped fossil fuel underneath us, energy companies want in. You ladies pick the coldest day of the year. Sure yep. Did. Jerry Davis and Wayne Yahe have watched the oil and gas industry change their land. Oil and gas was always here, but at the turn of the 90s, that's when it just ramped up. You know, in the last five years, you know, I, I barely even see any wildlife. It's slowly taken away. Jerry says his land has been destroyed, water polluted, and hunting not what it once was. Long ago was our happy days. When they take the gas out, the gas itself goes up in the air and it comes down, polluted the whole country. I'm wondering now, with all of these gas companies that want to come in and do more, what do you think of that? I know for a fact that we'll be involved in every step of that permanent process. We have a say. That tug of war between the environment and the economy puts Blueberry River First Nations, a small community of 550, in a tough spot. This is Blueberry River First Nations. CBC mapped all the active wells in the region, called the Montney. Thousands more are planned for development. If it's all extracted and burned, it's over 13 billion tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions. That's about 19 times Canada's annual emissions. In the midst of a climate emergency, uh, industry players and governments are planning on setting up these huge new fossil fuel projects. Kjell Kuhne is a researcher in Germany. He, among others, calls projects with such high levels of emissions carbon bombs. 
This is the global map of carbon bombs. This is his doomsday map. Billions of tons of emissions from Russia, China, the United States, and a potential 39 billion from Canada, with Montney the biggest of all. Focusing on these carbon bombs allows you to focus on the places where the climate emergency is created and figuring out ways to slow it down. We are still in time to stop that from happening. We need to be looking at this as a global perspective. But MLA for the region Dan Davies says the world needs this gas. India, China, other countries that absolutely rely on, on uh, this energy are going to go somewhere else for it. I mean, the experts say we got a decade to shut this thing down. Do you recognize that there's a certain urgency here in terms oh, of the timeline? Absolutely, there's urgency. Um, to say stop in 10 years, that's unrealistic. We are not there as a country. We're not there as a society. Are we going to meet our climate goals? I don't know. I don't know if we can. That's a lot of pressure on Blueberry River First Nations Chief Judy Desjardins. And so pretty soon there She's like watched industry profit from her land for decades. Our people were overlooked. Our standards were overlooked. There was no benefits to the nation. After a court decision and a recent agreement with the province, Blueberry River has a say in where new development happens. We're at a place where we are in the driver's seat and we can still restore our cultural and traditional values while working with industry, the government, and find that balance so that we can move forward. It gives me hope for the future of my unborn grandchildren. I know we're going to work towards helping them to preserve what we have left today. Moving forward, whatever this community decides, it will be on their own terms. So Tara, those carbon bombs you talked about, where are the others in Canada? Well, Adrian, there's 12 of them, and they're all in BC or Alberta. And the biggest ones are the natural gas fields, like the Montney. But there's also several oil sands projects, even three coal mines. Now, potential emissions from these are 39 billion tons. That is the seventh highest in the world, and enough to make Canada's climate targets meaningless should all of these fully go ahead. All right, extraordinary. Tara Carmen in Vancouver, thank you. Single-use plastics also present serious environmental challenges. Now, Ottawa has banned many of those products, but now big plastic is taking the federal government to court. Here's David Thurton on what's at stake. Hey, hey, ho, ho, plastic solution is about to go. A small protest for what is a big court case, a fight they say between nature and the big plastic lobby. This is the one of the largest uh, environmental cases for Canada. Uh, it's similar to when the government was looking for a price on carbon and carbon pollution. The case touches on the federal government's justification for listing plastics as toxic, hanging in the balance is Ottawa's ability to ban single-use plastic items, something shoppers have now embraced, some reluctantly. Now they're bringing back paper bags, which is like hard to carry. You know, plastic bags are more convenient. You can carry it around, it's strong. Paper is like, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it can rip on the snow. I think it's great. It's pretty easy to bring your own bags. <laughs> like, backpacks especially, um, it's not too bad. So I think it's like a really great step. A federal judge is hearing arguments from governments, environmental groups, and plastic companies. Lawyers for Imperial Oil, Dow Chemical, and others say they don't oppose reducing pollution, just the way the government is going about doing it. According to a legal brief the plastics industry filed in court, the federal government's plan has fatal flaws. Among those, it says it's not the federal government's place to regulate plastics. It's the provinces and territories. The government's decision to regulate all plastic products, it says, may be motivated by laudable goals like diverting waste from landfills. However, those goals must be pursued in accordance with the Constitution. The companies also say the federal government doesn't have enough science to back up the plastics ban. But Ottawa points to plastics littering rivers, even ending up in the water we drink. We won't be deterred by a few uh, international companies, multinationals, who are looking at, at, at their economic interest instead of looking at the greater interest of, of Canadians and the environment. 
all of this is being weighed by a federal court judge, knowing that their decision, still a couple of months away, could in effect overturn the government's single-use plastic ban. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. A new professional cricket league is taking off in India. What it could mean for young girls and the future of the sport. I just thought it would be the right thing to do. And a small gesture goes a long way. How an uncommon display of sportsmanship has become our moment. A snowmobile race in Labrador, billed as one of the longest and toughest in the world, has been cancelled midway because of rain and thawing snow. Organizers of the Canes Quest race said they made the tough call because of unsafe conditions. This comes after members of the Finnish team plunged through the ice in open water on Monday. To India now, where a new domestic cricket league for women is being called a revolution for the sport. Female cricket players there have long been present on the international stage, but now they're playing in front of large hometown crowds, a move that's already inspiring young fans. Salima Shivji has more from Mumbai. It's a scene as ubiquitous as it is fun. Gully cricket played casually on the streets of India, where the sport is almost a religion. Out here, it's reserved for the boys. This is the moment we were waiting for. But in here, it's women taking to the pitch. What a shot. And here is the first maximum. In the first match of a brand new professional league just launched in India, that's attracting big names and big money. And these fans are beside themselves. If you had to choose a few words to describe how you feel right now, what would they be? Ecstatic, in disbelief, very proud. It feels unreal right now because we, we've been wanting this for so long and it's finally here. For the first game in this Tata WPL. The Women's Premier League is already a moneymaker, raking in tens of millions of dollars in franchise and media rights even before the first ball was bowled. It's second only to women's basketball in terms of lucrative leagues around the world. The cricket players are also set to gain, not just in pay, but also exposure. We were always looking for this opportunity for so many years and uh, uh, now that platform is here and I think uh, that is definitely going to take women cricket to the next level. And never mind the financial bottom line, this new league is an inspiration for so many young girls across the country. At practice on a sunny afternoon at this Mumbai cricket club, there's a buzz in the air about the new league and what it means. It shows 12-year-old Janvi Vasaikar that her dream to make it to the big leagues might one day come true. It feels really very great because they, they is my uh, inspiration. Actually, it's my father's dream and my dreams too that I have to play for India one day. And it feels me that I will play for India. On the sidelines, her parents watch, brimming with pride. She's gained so much confidence watching the professional matches, her mom says. When Janvi plays, it's like I'm also playing and winning at the sport I love so much, her dad raves. The hand should be extended. Good. And for others here, the new league is about revealing a path that was shut to previous generations, when female players had to fight to be taken seriously. So women have a lot of power and they can do it better than men. A boost to women's cricket that's being called a game changer for the sport and for all young players with big dreams. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. Well, you're looking at the smiling faces of the Port Colborne Wave Under 11 House League team. This is a resilient group of girls ranging from 7 to 11 years old. This past weekend, they were in the playoffs up against some pretty stiff competition. But that didn't stop team captain Violet Carver from displaying some empathy for the other team. Tonight, a simple gesture of compassion is our moment. We were playing the St. Catharines Black Badgers. We were winning 3 nothing at the time in the third period, and my friend Chloe Geert scored the last goal. I was hugging my teammate and I just thought the goalie was just a little bit down, like she just fell on the ground and 
I knew that she was sad, so I went over and I just told her that she was doing good. I just thought it would be the right thing to do. It made me feel a little bit better, um, but yeah. Yeah, I was a little bit frustrated and... You dusted it off and got back in there. Yeah. We have from seven-year-olds to 11-year-olds, and it's just really great for the little ones to look up to, like, the older girls. Violet Carver from Fort Erie, Hi. team captain. And the goalie also said thank you, um, which... Yeah. <laughs> It's the little things that matter. Violet, Madison, you are both fantastic hockey players. Full disclosure, I know Violet. I know her mom. I know her family. Uh, you raised a very good human. That is the National for March the 7th. Have a good night.